Okay, uh, I'm gonna make this talk intentionally short uh, so that there'll be time if you wish to talk about business models and uh, paths we've taken for different uh, projects to get them to, uh, to market. Um, let me just introduce myself. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm not a scientist, although my degree's in physical chemistry. I'm not an engineer, even though I've taught engineering courses at the university level. I'm not a marketing person, uh, even though I've had marketing titles in a multi-billion dollar company. And I'm not a salesman, although you're going to call me a liar on that comment in about five minutes. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, these are my three current business cards. I'm an emeritus professor at the university. I still oversee some uh, graduate students. Uh, I run a company called Ex uh, Extraordinary Absorbance, which we're going to talk about some of their products in a minute, and something called ZK Sciences, which I'll touch on in just a minute. But there's really three things I want you to come away with after this talk. The first is that most important inventions uh, involve a bit of serendipity. A good inventor sees something that shouldn't be there not what should be, and tries to figure out why it's there. Um, the second is, you've got to wear many hats. I'm an inventor, but I had to take all the roles I just described to you to take ideas uh, from my head through the laboratory and into the marketplace. Finally, and I'm actually a dual citizen who grew up in the US. I'm sitting in Florida right now. Something that may be a little bit hard for Canadians, but uh, you've got to push your products push your ideas. If you don't, nobody else will. And um, if you believe in what you're selling, people will buy it. Um, that's really the, the reason I took today's uh, uh, talk enthusiastically. I don't usually get a medically inclined audience and I'm gonna skew this towards some new things that might have uh, medical applications. Next. Keith, next. Good, nope, oh, back one. All right, just to give you a little bit of my history, when I got out of school, uh, I started with a company called Air Products and Chemicals. I'm, I'm very lucky as, in, as inventors go. I've never worked on a major project in my life since I was 19 that I didn't originate, which is interesting. Anyway, I started with a company called Air Products and uh, by its name, you might understand that it's a gas company, an industrial gas company. I was given an empty lab and told to find a better way to separate air. That was uh, 40 years ago. And the adsorbents I created there when I was right out of school are still the basis of many industrial nitrogen generation cycles and uh, variants of them that other people have uh, uh, modified over the last 40 years are the heart of many oxygen generation systems. And in, in fact, if you have uh, uh, you know, a portable oxygen generator for an ambulatory person, the adsorbent in it was originated by myself at Air Products. I then went to a company called uh, Engelhart, was again given a blank lab, an empty lab, and told to invent a new kind of cracking catalyst. Well, my efforts in that were an abysmal failure. But they invited, they uh, it resulted in several remarkable spin offs. The first generation of what were practical lead removal agents, and also what's now the second generation, uh, evolved from that. Radioactive decontamination agents, we'll talk about that in a minute. Something called molecular gates, uh, which are currently used uh, in uh, upgrading low quality natural gas and are, are being applied now to. Uh, landfill gas to turn poor quality methane into high quality fuel. Uh, actually, we've uh, invented another generation of that at the University of Alberta, but I'm not going to make that the, my topic for today. What I'm going to mostly speak about is something we invented uh, at uh, the University of Alberta, which we'll call fixed silver or nanodots on so-called molecular sieves. In 2015, I founded a startup company called Extraordinary Absorbents. Uh, the things you're going to hear about now are, are uh, either in commercialization or being commercialized by extraordinary absorbents. Um, we're small, but we're a world leader in a niche market, which we'll call titanium silicate molecular sieves, but a fascinating market. Finally, uh, in 2019, um, founded another company with my seven children and my wife. Each of them has an, an interesting expertise that I'm going to urge you if, you, if this talk catches your imagination at all, I'm gonna urge you to, uh, to go to the website, 
uh, www.zksciences.com. And at the bottom of the homepage, there's a four minute film called uh, ZK Sciences and Introduction. I urge you to take a look at that if, if anything here catches your imagination, because it'll teach you a lot more about what these so-called zeolites are. Anyway, we make additives that make explosive plant growth, and they really are explosive. It's been centered on hemp. Um, we have been through first stage funding and exterior validation. And in this country right now, we're looking at how to proceed to second stage, which uh, might be uh, development with a major partner or selling the technology. We will see. Next slide, please, Keith. You may never heard of molecular sieves, but they touch your life. I think they're frankly the most valuable set of inor inorganic materials there are in the world. They impact three areas appreciably. Ion exchange. Uh, when phosphates went out of vogue for uh, water softeners, they came in and upper end detergents and replaced them. Heavy metal scavenging. I just told you that uh, molecular sieves, in particular titanium-based molecular sieves, are the state-of-the-art in lead removal for drinking water. They're also used for decontamination of uh, aqueous uh, uh, nuclear contaminants. Uh, variants of things uh, that I invented years ago uh, are currently used at Fukushima to scavenge the uh, cesium and strontium that's polluting the waters there. Um, we think we can do better there, too. Air separ or absorption, air separation, by far the biggest uh, separation process in the world. The majority of air separation is now done uh, over molecular sieves absorptively. Most people think it's done distillatively, but that's now in the minority. Um, desiccants or deep drying desiccants or drying agents. When natural gas comes out of the ground, it's, it's uh, saturated with water. And it takes a great deal of drying to get it ready for compression uh, into uh, a pipeline for transportation. Uh, there are enormous million pound beds of uh, molecular sieves in Alberta that do this and all around the world that do this. Hydrocarbon separations. Finally, catalysis, uh, fluidized catalytic cracking, turning heavy oil into gasoline is mostly based on molecular sieves. Their uses run into the thousands. Next slide, Keith. Okay. A discovery we made at the University of Alberta, okay, was that we found a relatively simple process to put silver into certain molecular sieves and then transform it into stable nanospheres on the surface of these molecular sieves. Now, this only happens for certain molecular sieves, and as I said, we're a leader in this, uh, but this results in enormous concentrations of surface uh, nanospheres of silver on the molecular sieves that we can make. Uh, they're incredibly uniform. On the left is a size distribution. Uh, here is a material that's between one and four nanometers in size. We also have ones that go between six and seven nanometers. They're remarkably stable. When people think of nanosilver, they think of something that will fall apart at 75 degrees C at room temperature, persist for a month or two. Um, this material we know is stable to at least 10 years and at least 500 degrees C. It's there. Next uh, slide, Keith. Okay. Okay. I love this. This is a transmission electron uh, my, my microscope uh, photograph of some of these nanodots. If you look on the right, you see the stripes in those little circles? That's actually the atomic planes of silver. So that is about a 20 atom deep silver part particulate, so small you can't see it in an x-ray pattern. In an electron diffraction pattern, it indicates it's pure metallic silver. Next slide, Keith. Well, what the hell is pure metallic silver good for? And now I'm gonna talk into possible medical applications. Um, I told you that um, air separation is now done mostly on molecular sieves, probably 65%. There's a problem though with molecular sieves for medical applications. While molecular sieves differentiate nitrogen and oxygen very, very well, they don't differentiate oxygen and argon very well. As a matter of fact, they don't differentiate them at all generally. And there's about 1% argon in the air. So when you make an oxygen product adsorptively, it isn't pure oxygen. It's 95% oxygen and 5% argon. That bothers some medical people. Doesn't bother me, but it bothers some medical people. 
These silver nanodots not only discriminate between nitrogen and oxygen, but they differentiate between oxygen and argon. This allows the production of 99.9% .9 plus oxygen in a single pass adsorptively from air. What else do they do? Well, they suppress noble gas isotopes in nuclear reactors. Actually, that's sort of how we got into this. And they generate high quality, inexpensive antimicrobial silver. The bottom picture is just a yeast culture that we've put, um, now I'm not a biologist. I'm not a medical person. I make rocks for a living, okay? Please understand that. Okay. Um, these generate extremely active antimicrobial nanosilver. Um, I spent a year and lost a year's pay trying this to bring this uh, to the medical field. If you're not in the medical field, they don't want to hear about it. Uh, right now where it's going though, is uh, it's under testing by a major paint manufacturer uh, as an antimicrobial additive to paint. Um, We've had some testing done on this. It's very encouraging. I'll tell you some funny serendipity. We live 50 yards from the ocean and we have balconies on three different floors. And the balconies have railings that have bright white paint. And every six months you have to repaint them because they turn green. Being, you know, 50 yards from the ocean, all kinds of things grow. So we had our handyman last, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, add a gram per gallon in the white paint on our third floor balcony. The other balconies are green, it's bright white. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so let me delve into three things for a minute that might catch the interest of a uh, medically inclined audience. The reason, on the left, we have something called isotherms or uh, amounts picked up of gas uh, per their partial pressure of nitrogen, oxygen, and argon. Now, uh, we see that nitrogen is very preferentially absorbed uh, what we see that's different for our materials, the so-called silver ETS-10, is that the argon is preferentially adsorbed over oxygen. So uh, on the right, you've got a chromatographic column. If we push a mixture of oxygen and argon uh, uh, down a column, what happens is the oxygen comes out first and the argon is preferentially bound. Uh, next slide, please. Qualitatively, what this does is uh, in a normal molecular sieve where you don't have that differentiation, if you push air through a bed, you'll get oxygen plus argon coming out and nitrogen in back of it. In this case, you get oxygen coming out, followed by argon, followed by nitrogen. Now we've got a professor in chemical engineering working with us uh, on this uh, up at the University of Alberta, uh, who's getting very encouraging results. If you'd like to hear a little bit more about it, contact me and I'll put you in contact with them. Okay, slide nine, please. Okay, next is the silver dots, for some reason, and nobody can explain why, interact with noble gases. That's why they can differentiate oxygen from argon, preferentially binding the argon. By the time you get to bigger uh, uh, noble gas molecules, the effect is much more pronounced. Uh, here we're seeing so-called isotherms on this silver ETS-10 for xenon, nitrogen, and oxygen. All you can see here is that the xenon is greatly preferentially absorbed over nitrogen. In fact, well, you can't read it off a graph here. Uh, the, the actual preference of xenon over nitrogen is about 30,000 to one. That allows us to uh, concentrate uh, xenon very, very easily. Um, and before any of you ask, they're starting to see the same thing for radon, but that's all right. Uh, so how the heck did we get into this? Next slide, please, Keith. Okay, it turns out that short-lived isotopes of xenon uh, occur whenever there's nuclear fission. If you've got a reactor running somewhere, uh, there are a couple of isotopes that have half-lives of four or five days that will inevitably leak out. If you have an underground nuclear explosion, uh, there are um, a couple of short-lived isotopes that, uh, that will leak out. And uh, next slide, Tanya. Tanya, <laughs> that's my wife here. My wife's a math clock <laughs> running on me. Okay, this is a, a, a chart of monitoring sites uh, run by something called the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, which I work with a lot, uh, which is part of the UN. 
uh, they triangulate um, readings of these isotopes to figure out if there's been a nuclear accident somewhere or uh, if some, there's been an, an uh, underground nuclear detonation or if there's a rogue reactor somewhere. This is how we got into it. We actually got into it as a defense application, but why the heck should this be of any interest to you? Xenon is a magnificent anesthetic. Um, it's used in, in Eastern Europe, but the people take it right out of a nuclear reactor, which isn't real healthy for people. Um, but there's some xenon in the air here. Uh, xenon industrially is produced by the, uh, uh, in the, as a byproduct of the distillative separation of oxygen from air. And its supply is very limited. Demand has grown for it in, for example, high intensity auto headlights. It is a fantastic uh, anesthetic, but the, the supply demand for this is so inelastic. If you tried to do it on a massive scale, it would be impossible because there are no intentional uh, xenon supplies. This is a byproduct of, uh, of uh, oxygen uh, distillative generation. Okay, well, we have the ability to concentrate xenon from trace levels to very high levels. There's no reason in the world we couldn't design using the adsorbents we do for nuclear detection and for nuclear decontamination of, react of reactors in Europe. There's no reason that couldn't be adapted to recycle xenon in a medical setting and make it practical. I, I, I would hope maybe that in the oxygen or the antimicrobial application might catch some of your interest. Okay, um, two more slides. And this has nothing to do with medicine, but just to make you dream a little bit. The titanosilicates we make have very weird molecular structures. They're chains of titanium strung together with rings of silica. Silica is a great insulator. Uh, titanium has a three, four couple that's close. So what you've got is a filament of a semiconductor. And there are numerous articles citing this as the best example of a quantum wire in existence. Last slide, please. Because of that property, um, these are some of the few inorganic materials that have been grown on, on uh, multiple occasions in space, trying to make them ultra pure. They have such interesting properties. If you look in the lower left, if you apply a current to a crystal of this, it actually lays but the real future of this is in semiconductors. This is a new type of semiconductor. And we're working with people at John Hopkins at Texas Tech to try to convert that into a solar voltaic collector. Okay, has nothing to do with medicine, but I just thought it looked state of the art. Okay, Keith, that's the end of it. We've got 12 minutes left, I think. There we go. Thank you very much. Steve, for that for that talk, let me just uh, escape out of the, the slideshow here and bring everyone up and check the check the chats. Um, well, while I'm checking the chats, how about I ask a question so that I can organize myself while you're answering? Sure. Uh, Cause I couldn't see that during the presentation. Um, you, it, it seems to me that many of your uh, uh, technologies were like you said at the beginning, serendipitous. It's, you were look, you you created something and then found markets for it, yes. as opposed to necessarily going the the other route, which is, um, you know, it, it 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 really points to having to keep one's eyes open for opportunities that what might not be immediately uh, evident in your. In, That's in, where great discoveries are made. Yeah, and but uh, consequently, your 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 products and your innovations are have an international appeal yes. uh, very much so. So can you tell me, because you're straddling the border between the US and Canada, do you have like preferential companies you start in Canada versus those you start in the US? Like what's the difference between like, Yana just told us that she's marketed to the US first because it was the easiest to get there um, well, early on. So what are your, what is your strategy in terms of this international marketing? Uh, surprisingly, and I wish I could quantify it better than this. I'm, I, there's nothing better than word of mouth. Okay. Our biggest market right now is the silver ETS pen to 
about a dozen reactor complexes in Europe. How did they learn about it? They learned about it from these people designing detectors to find out where nefarious nuclear activities are going on. Uh, other products, we make uh, products for the purification of natural gas. I, I hate to say this because it, it may sound discouraging to people. I don't go looking for customers. They tend to come to us. <laughs> I wish we all had that problem, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, you don't want to, you, you wish that the granting company, granting agencies would ask you to take their money to, to do research, but well, it's I, usually I the other way around. Our general business model is, uh, is identifying somebody with a particular need that we might be able to attack uh, by making an absorbent that's a separation of purification agent having a problem they just can't get off the shelf some, from somebody. Getting them to fund the research for a license. And if they fully fund the research, they can get an exclusive license in their field of use. However, the company retains the IP and the ability to market it in other areas. That's our basic business model. Um, it, it, you know, our little company, it's not a very big company, but it's self-supporting. We don't have to go to granting agencies. Last year was the first year I was able to pay myself something, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> there's, you know, you've got to get out and meet people. You got to get out and listen to what people want. How did the lead removal agents come into being? Because all over the press, 30 years ago, there was a panic that lead was retarding children. We were making failed cracking catalysts that I recognized had divalent sites that would be very selective toward a divalent heavy metal ion, lead. Boom, it worked. It and its variants are the state of the art. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, methane upgrading, what's a hard thing to take out of methane? Nitrogen, they're almost identical in size. We discovered accidentally by seeing an incredible number of separation experiments that screwed up that as we heated a particular material, its pore shrunk. And we found that we could shrink it right to the size between nitrogen and methane. So that nitrogen would go in, methane wouldn't. And I went around to people, I was in a big company when I first invented this and, uh, and tried to sell it to people in the company. Nobody wanted it. Uh, but once then the chief technology officer of the company called me up and said, I had somebody come to my office and he wondered if you could take nitrogen out of methane. Is there any way in the world you could do that? And I said, hmm, let me go think about that. And a week later, I come into his office and I said, I think I got an idea. And of course, I already had the thing done. And, and that's how we got into that market. Um, cool. What else can I tell you about? Silver nanodots uh, were invented for a defense application. It was funded by the U.S. government. Uh, although they gave us all the patent rights, believe it or not, um, evolved into decontamination agents for nuclear reactors. That's a growing business. We don't sell much of it, but Jesus, you talk about medical people. We sell that stuff for 10,000 Canadian a kilo. Okay, my wife says- We, have, we have a couple more questions. Um, one's from uh, Farnaz. And it is, could you explain, please explain the commercialization process for your products? Like just in, I guess, a brief explanation of a few, the key, the key points along the way. You got to find somebody with a need. You got to find somebody with a need that can't be met. You've got mm -hmm. to come up with a solution for them. And then you've got to convince them it was their idea in the first place. <laughs> That's it. That's the, the golden rule. Easy peasy, wonderful. Okay, I <laughs> I like it. Uh, and this, uh, we have another question from uh, Vivian Mushawar. Uh, impressive work, Steve. Can you tell us about how you tackled market fit um, and how early you thought of that? Um, or uh, was it that you started up front by focusing on the market need? So- Market need, okay. We, as I told you, I I'm very, very lucky because I've never worked on anything significant I didn't originate. So I've got a catalog in my head of materials that nobody in the world knows about. And they've been characterized. So I, I, I may see a need in a newspaper 
and call somebody, okay? Um, you have to have, I hate to tell you this, you all in your heart, if you're inventors, believe if you've got a better mousetrap, the, the world's gonna beat a, uh, uh, a path to your door. Well, the, the fact is the problem in the world isn't mice, it's rats. Uh, nobody gives a good goddamn. Uh, everybody wants their own thing, okay? Uh, so you've got to, to find somebody with a need and you can find it in a newspaper, you can find it on TV, you can find it between contacts and you've got to come up with an idea to meet their need that they haven't heard anywhere else that they can't get anywhere else. If you do that, uh, they'll give you anything. Excellent. Um, and I guess we, uh, I have one more question for you in the last uh, couple minutes. Um, you said you had a hard time breaking into the medical market. Oh yeah. And that's because, and, and you attributed that to because you don't have the medical background, but you must have done some research into like, because the regulation, the regulatory bodies for much of your work are very different than the medical market. Uh, that Did you find that was a major hurdle also potentially? No. no. The medical market, you know, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no regulatory problems and gas separations. Um, and the things in water purification, for example, I mean, unless you overtly do something to harm people, you know, you're, you're, you're fine. Medical, I don't know about the regulation. For example, that's why we're, we're at a multi-billion dollar paint company. Uh, again, the model is find somebody who needs something who can bring it to market. Give them what they can bring to market, but keep something for yourself. Gotcha. Okay. okay. And so no, um, I honest to God believe, let me just wrap this up for a minute. I honest to God believe for two or three years of my life, the reason I was born was because of this nano silver. It is unbelievable. I mean, it is, a, okay, from what testing I've seen, it is a log six kill agent in low doses, a log six kill agent against bacteria, fungus, and viruses. And I can't market it. I don't know how. <laughs> maybe, and the maybe. more important thing is, the more important thing, because especially in Alberta, so many people are familiar with, quote, nano silver, unquote, is not just that it's stable. It's not just that it's long lasting. It's infinitely cheaper. We can make it for about twice the price of the silver. We can take a bar of silver and by doubling its price, we can turn it into five nanometer silver particles, all firmly stuck on usable surfaces. Very, very cool. Well, I hope, with, with, I hope that catches somebody's well, imagining. Well, hopefully there's more serendipity and maybe there's someone in the audience who can reach out to you who has like the exact link to the market that you're looking for. That's <laughs> and, why I agreed to do the talk today, Keith. That's honest Excellent. To God. Thank you very much, Steve, for this, uh, this excellent talk and for answering our questions. There's a lot of uh, very nice uh, inspirational responses in the, uh, in the chat there. If I can throw up one more, just if you can, if you yes. want to be amused, Go to zksciences.com, go to the bottom, see the four minute film. It's really worth your time.